Because if you're going to lose five pounds of fat, five pounds of fat all at the same time, all of the toxins stored in that fat, and by the way, we biopsy the fat, heavy metals, pesticides, I mean, it is full of stuff. You have to process those. And if you don't bind those toxins, you are going to experience extreme brain fog. And the number of people who don't heed that and say, Dave, I didn't believe you. I just tried doing it. And yeah, I felt like I got brain fog. Uh, and I, it took me six weeks to feel like myself again, just I, I couldn't focus. Yeah, that's what happens when you dump all the pesticides and metals from your fat into your circulatory system. Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter, quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Welcome to the Body Mind Department Podcast. I'm your host, Seem Lund, and our guest today is Dave Asprey. Dave is the founder of Bulletproof, True Dark, and many other companies. He's a best selling author of several books, and he's often called the father of biohacking. This episode is brought to you by Katsu Training. Katsu bands incorporate blood flow moderation training that trick the body into thinking that it's lifting heavier weights than it actually is. When traditional weightlifting requires you to reach 70 to 80% of your one repetition maximum to stimulate muscle hypertrophy, then Katsu achieve that effect only at 20 to 30%. So it's perfect for treating injuries or use when you don't have access to heavy weights. Research about Katsu bands also shows it lowers blood pressure, speeds up recovery from injuries, releases stem cells, builds muscle, burns fat, and prevents age-related muscle loss. These things are a game changer and I use them almost every day. If you want to try out the Katsu cycle bands, then use the code SEAM for a 10% discount at katsu-global.com. That's katsu-global.com and the 10% code is SEAM, S-I-I-M. Dave, welcome to the show. SEAM, thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure and I appreciate your work. So I'm happy to, happy to be here. Yeah, I'm also glad to talk with you and to have, have my own podcast uh, because it, like your work, especially like the Bulletproof Radio, was one of my first uh, like introductions to biohacking and ketosis and uh, that sort of thing. So yeah, I'm uh, gonna, glad that we can actually you know, talk face to face now. <laughs> it's, uh, it's beautiful because there's something where, where we go out there and, and early stage biohackers go out and find you know, here's some stuff that works and there's enough crumbs that we're going to test it on ourselves, see what happens. And then it creates, just like you're describing, it creates this, oh, okay, there's enough here. And I think you've gone in with metabolic autophagy. Uh, you've really gone in and said, I, there's more research. And so it sort of starts a snowball and then more and more gathers as it speeds up. So now we know more about ketosis, we know more about circadian timing, all that kind of stuff than anyone would have known 10 years ago. But it takes all the crazy researchers in academia and it takes people assembling them, but it takes a community of people, not just one person, in order to get all the information out there in a way that people can digest it. And I think you're, you're doing great work. So I, I yeah. truly appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and you're so right. Like, uh, there needs to be uh, like uh, some sort of a community effort in a way that we need to kind of bounce the, our ideas from each other and you know share share different experiments and that's how uh, the kind of field moves forward as a whole. Yeah. So how did you? And that's get... also why that's always the, the conferences really matter. And yeah. you have you got Health Optimization Summit. You've got the Biohacking Conference. Um, that I started a while ago. It's in LA. I think it is eighth year. But you need a physical coming together, and COVID's trying to stop that. And then you need the digital ways that we come together, and then you need podcasts. And so I was really happy when you started yours. And it's uh, it's cool. I'm glad you're doing well. Yeah. So so how did you start, and how long have you been doing this biohacking? Well, let's see. So it was 2004. Uh, I was in uh, the Himalayas. <laughs> And even before then, I'd, I didn't have the name for biohacking, but I was doing this stuff that no one had heard of. Uh, things like electricity over my brain, the first light stimulator for brain flow or for blood flow in the brain. Um, that was in the late 90s. And smart drugs in the late 90s. And it turns out there's an old generation of biohackers, guys like Steve Folks, uh, who, uh, and Dirk and Sandy from the anti-aging front, and the even 1970s bodybuilders. Uh, they were all putting knowledge together. It just wasn't well distributed. Even Robert Atkins on the, the side of, well, he wasn't as much into fasting as he was in just in ketosis from any type of fat and any kind of protein, just you know, don't eat carbs, you'll be all right. So all of these were out there, but they didn't really talk to each other very much. And I wanted it all to come together. So I had these thoughts about it when I was in Tibet, when I had yak butter tea, that was the genesis for Bulletproof Coffee. 
And when I came back, I really started saying, how do I build a community to make these people come together? Uh, so it's really been, whatever that is, 16 years um, wow. of working on it. Yeah. Uh, and I registered uh, the first biohacking domain in, I think, 2008, if memory serves. Mm. Yeah, it's, a, it's been quite a long journey. And uh, yeah, it's, it's only actually at the beginning, so to say, that we are only like a bit scratching the surface of uh, what we know about the human body and uh, like the technologies we use and what the potential actually is in the future. It, it's kind of funny. If you look back on the history of computer hacking, uh, which it was my background, uh, you end up looking at open source. And the original hackers are like, you know what? If you let the big guys like Microsoft and uh, I guess back then it would have been Apple or IBM, if they own all of the source code, they will do bad things with it and we'll never know what they're doing because we can't look inside the box. And so hackers came out, not the, you know, the black hat, we're going to steal your credit card number guys, but the guys who said, we can build stuff that other people can't build and we're going to build what we want to build and we're going to do what we want to do. So <laughs> they went out and built Linux, you know, Linus Torvalds, the whole open source m movement. And if you look now, this is about 35 years after that movement started. There was one crazy guy, uh, I believe from somewhere in Scandinavia, who said, you know, I'm going to do this. And now most of what we're communicating over today is run based on open source where everyone can look under the hood. And that was really important because if you can see what's happening in your code versus just running the code, you can see if there's something bad in there. And what I think is happening now on the pharmaceutical side of things and on the biology and even the medical side of things is exactly that. Biohackers like you and me, uh, we're going out there and saying, oh, actually, we're not going to just go in and, you know, a nice man in a white lab coat is going to tell us to take some of these pills and everything will be just fine. We want to know how it works and we want to change it. So yeah. there's new knowledge that's coming into medicine from biohacking and new knowledge from medicine that's coming here. Today, Microsoft is the largest contributor to open source code out there. Microsoft, that people mm -hmm. were, they fought against it for years. What I forecast is in another 10, 15 years is that the pharmaceutical industry and medical schools and all that, they will be <laughs> a lot more biohacker friendly than they have been a while ago because they'll realize this is where innovation comes from. And when they share openly that uh, the collaboration will work better. So some of the medical monopoly stuff won't work. And if you know, pharmaceuticals in, uh, say, Europe or the U.S. are opposed to that, that's okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's billions of other people in countries that won't have those problems. So the, the end of it, I've, I would forecast. It's not, not really the end. It's just the evolution where you and I have a right to know what's going on in our body. We don't need a permission slip to do it. And we can get the tests that we want. We don't have to uh, go beg to get the test. And then when we say, you know, I want to try this thing to make my body do this, that you're allowed to do it without there being any sort of legal repercussions. And today, mm -hmm. just peptides and things like that are, you know, there's a war on peptides you don't even see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, quite, quite interesting to see that. Yeah, because in a way, you should have like at least uh, educated freedom about what you put into your body and uh, what do you do on a, on a like, daily basis. So... Uh, everything everything you know should be somewhat allowed as long as you have like the enough education and you're willing to take the risks yourself the unfortunate situation yeah. is that you're yeah, like the big big uh, medical companies and governments they try to let's say not even tell you or not even give you the information so that you wouldn't do something yeah. uh, to to yourself it's a it's a fundamental human right uh, to decide what you put into your body. And that means you could decide what you don't put into your body, as in, I don't want to eat the margarine. Even if you tell me it's good for me, you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, maybe I'm wrong when I say you're wrong, but it's my right to decide that. And you also uh, don't get to say that oh, this food has to be fortified by law with something that's toxic for me. I'm talking about folic acid. A third of people can't metabolize folic acid. So it's really good that you're reducing folic acid deficiencies in two thirds of us while messing up one third of us. And that's just dumb government planning. I should have the right to choose. Yeah. And this comes down to really fundamental human freedom. And there, there's going to be more and more of this as people who get sick and stay sick. Uh, some of the post COVID people are saying, I feel like I have chronic fatigue syndrome. I'm like, yeah, I've had chronic fatigue syndrome. That sucked. <laughs> and you'll do anything to stop it, even if it doesn't have a, a prescription pad with it. So I don't think that it'll succeed to drive, 
you know, knowledge of ketosis or knowledge of fasting or knowledge of antisenescence drugs or knowledge of anti-aging therapies to draw this underground, it won't work. Uh, even with internet censorship happening the way it's happening now, it's the cat's too far out of the bag. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> that's also, and uh, yeah, it will be yeah, too late to kind of fully suppress and uh, censor this kind of information. All you have to do is take someone like me who used to weigh 300 pounds <laughs> and say, you used to weigh 300 pounds? I go, yeah, I did. You want to see my stretch marks? And they go, that can't be possible. Go, well, it is. And when, when people see that and they've heard a story from big media or whatever that says, well, if you're fat, you're going to stay fat and, and do these things that don't work like diet soda. Well, eventually you hear enough of those. You say, someone's BSing me. And it's not the people who used to be fat who aren't fat anymore. And you know that happens at a very grassroots level. It happens in churches. It happens in grocery stores. It happens in places that aren't the internet. And it's already unstoppable because enough people have had massive transformations. I, I did the math. People lost a million pounds from the Bulletproof Diet book. <laughs> and like, okay, they talk. And you, you, just, you can't reverse it that much. It just takes a while. Robert Atkins, the Atkins Diet, came out in 1972, the year I was born. <laughs> so I have a first edition of his book. It was yeah. directionally right. It was wrong about the type of fat and whatever. But it was to say, if I'd have known that when I was 16, then I would not have been as fat as I was. It would have really helped me in massive ways. And that's one of the things that inspired me to write Bulletproof is the information just wasn't out there to write the Bulletproof blog. So what I think is going to happen is you know, someone's going to hear this podcast, read one of your books, read one of my books, uh, whatever, and they're going to do it younger and younger and younger. So you and I are saying, oh, this is so new. Really, this is a continuation of something from whatever this third, from 50 years ago uh, yeah. when, when he wrote the first books on ketosis. And his was a continuation of Banting's work, which was in whatever the late 1800s, saying, hey, yeah. what do you know? If you quit eating carbs, <laughs> you lose weight. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the same applies to overall biohacking as well. So biohacking as a, as a, like a practice or a, activity has been practiced for yeah like ever since humans uh you know started to roam the earth and like we've been using different yeah. medit meditation techniques different t types of fasting different types of nutrition supplements uh, all those things they are like essentially biohacking we just have like new tools and uh, new techniques that we use nowadays yeah we've accelerated it exponentially uh, and if you look at back in the Enlightenment, we had some really serious things. I wish I could turn my camera. I have a, a picture from like the 1600s, a painting, and it's a, an alchemist wearing the robes and the little things like that, talking to Mother Nature. So it's like sort of technology versus nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this has been going on for hundreds of years. And that even comes from uh, this idea of, okay, how, how are we going to live a long time? Who's doing it? Monks living in caves, <laughs> you know, the Tantra, Ayurveda, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, thousands of years of observations of what works and what doesn't work. And you should do this at this time. Uh, it's, again, it's distribution of the knowledge. How do we get it out there? And then in the West, we decided we were going to discard all of that. And now we're rediscovering it. And I have very consciously at the beginning of biohacking, I'm going to be very Western on this. But meanwhile, I did figure out the effects of yak butter tea went beyond just ketosis. Um, back in <laughs> when I was learning meditation from the masters in an ancient lineage, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're saying, wait, and every time I try to disprove something uh, that comes from back then with numbers or data, I'm like, oh, there must be another mechanism there that I didn't understand. Like, the, the tiny droplets of fat in water do something that that's meaningful metabolically. And I did not know that from the yak butter tea. And by the way, neither did Tibetans. Um, they could feel it. But I ended up funding research at the University of Washington that proved what was going on. Like, I knew that you had to blend your coffee in butter. I just couldn't tell you why. <laughs> so what, what does it do to, them? What, to the coffee? Well, uh, Jerry Pollock uh, wrote um, a books about exclusion zone water. And when you drink normal water, they, he calls it bulk water. And this guy's written, he's, he's done a huge amount of research, spoken at a couple of the conferences and you know, many decades with this in basic water chemistry. And no one could adequately explain from just surface tension why water bubbles, uh, like it forms a, a lens at the top of a graduated cylinder. And he said, all right, we've got to dig in on this. And he found that when water is near a surface, that it changes its structure into something that's a little bit more gel-like. So when we drink water, before we can use it to fold proteins or make uh, electrons in the Krebs cycle, 
uh, for essentially any enzymatic based process in the body, the first thing we do is we transform the water from bulk water into exclusion zone water. And you do that by putting the water near droplets of fat and different fats have different levels of exclusion zone that'll happen. And very interestingly, uh, you, it works much better with either vibration or with infrared light. That's called heat. <laughs> so what happens is you, uh, you do this uh, and you can look at it under a microscope. It's very visible. You say, this is the clear water and right near the fat or right near the, the, uh, the barrier, whatever you're measuring it, the water up against, you see a change in the water. You just need a very good microscope to do it. So when I funded the research there, he said, all right, let's see what different fats do. And with butter oil, basically ghee, <laughs> he said, that forms the largest exclusion zone I've ever seen. And you know, he was all excited, he emailed me the, the photos from the microscope. And he said, so this is it. When you blend it in hot liquid, You've got heat, you've got blending, you've got tons of surface area. So what the Tibetans had figured out was, uh, you know, if, okay, I'm just going to describe when I first had yak butter tea because it's, it's too crazy to believe this. <laughs> We're about a quarter mile from a river. Okay, it's 10 degrees below zero. It's a, by the way, those are American degrees. So you mm -hmm. know, everything is frozen. Uh, <laughs> and um, still, so a lady wakes up in the morning and she makes tea. And there's a little mud hut in, on, on the side of Mount Kailash. And to make tea, you have to burn yak dung. So you know, they're lighting up the big piles of yak poop and burn, you know, heating up the water. And she takes it, she makes the tea. And instead of just pouring this nice hot tea into cups, which would be really nice, no, she takes a scoop of butter. She puts it in this big wooden butter churn. She pours the hot tea in this cold butter churn. And then she takes her... Uh, you know, the, the paddle on the churn and she goes to chunk to chunk and like spends 10 minutes just pounding on the water and the butter. And, and I'm like, this is just odd. But then again, Tibetans, you know, they wear different hats and they you know, turn prayer wheels. And it's just a very different culture. One, <laughs> one that I, I respect. Well, and then they pour this kind of lukewarm concoction out and you drink it. And I felt massively better. Now you could say, what the heck? Come on, eat the butter, drink the tea. Like, how hard is it? <laughs> yeah. it? It just doesn't work though. I tried it, right? And the reason it doesn't work is all of that churning with the heat and the tiny water droplets that they're getting, they're turning the water into exclusions on water. Why? Because they're at very high altitude and it's really cold. And for them to survive really well, do you really want to have to make heat? Because mm. all they're eating for breakfast is sampa, which is barley flour, and they drink some yak butter tea and then they can carry a couch on their back up Everest. I mean, these people are superhuman beyond belief. Like they're, they're half my size and twice as strong as me and cold resilient. And well, I know now even this, that research came out even after I wrote the Bulletproof Diet. I'm like, there's six theories for why blending the butter really matters. But that was the one that I could at least back with science. But no one knew this except the Tibetans figured it out. They just didn't do the science to understand, oh, it's the water. And it's because your body doesn't have to take its own heat and electrons to heat up the water to transform it. Yeah. And, and then you take that and you cut it back to whole body vibration, yeah. which is something I've been a huge fan of for 10 years. We make the Bulletproof vibe. You, you stand on this thing. Well, what's going on there? Well, the water is being mechanically agitated right near lipid membranes. You know, cell membranes are all made out of fats. <laughs> <laughs> and magically, do you feel different after you do that? Yes. Does more research keep coming out about the benefits of this for anti-aging, for bone density, even for changing the bacteria in your gut? It does keep coming out. And I think some of the benefits are from exclusions on water, that transformation, because your cell membranes are piezoelectric. And so, man, we're just we're peeling off layer after layer after layer and finding the coolest stuff inside the body. And every one of those is a mechanism for new, um, new work to be done that piezoelectric cell membrane thing. So yeah. that means that if you vibrate your cell membranes, they make electricity. We run on electricity. Does that mean that the frequency with which you vibrate your cells, if you manipulate that, that it might have different effects on the body? Yeah, it's called sound. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it does have different effect on the body. And there's other mechanical vibration. Yeah. But those are, there are new devices. I have a couple of them on my desk here that are taking advantage of that. And so... I'm just thinking this is the best time ever because we can measure data in ways you never could possibly do. You can do things like pulse wave analysis to see how, how long does it take a, a wave to travel through your, your circulatory system, which is something I've been uh, more interested in lately. And 
according to the analysis, uh, the, the normal tables, uh, apparently I'm 27 years old. <laughs> at least my arteries are, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but we couldn't get the data. But if I went to some you know, Chinese medicine guy who's 90 and has been studying this for years, he'd probably put two fingers right here and go, yeah, of course. <laughs> he already knew it. So we're just taking ancient knowledge and putting numbers on it. That's my, my real belief. Yeah, yeah. The, the structure of water is really interesting. And uh, it does make uh, sense as well because uh, you know, the, the definition or the, the idea behind structured water is that it's sort of a, like this uh, trans, translucent uh, state between vapor and solid water. Uh, so it's like this uh, transitionary phase. So that's like the fourth phase yeah. of water. So yeah, like blending, it does make sense that it does create this sort of uh, the fourth phase. I have tried the weirdest things and, and MCT oil uh, does something different. And I always say brain octane oil, just when I say MCT, at least the not lauric acid MCTs. Lauric acid doesn't metabolize the way the C8 MCTs um, that, I, that I put out there a while ago, um, the, the way they do. So uh, most of what I'm talking about is the C8. Uh, and by the way, I, there were no studies that showed you that C8 was better than C10 or C12 when I came out with brain octane. I just knew I'm going to test all three of these. And if you put C8 in there, it feels like rocket fuel. You put C10, it kind of works. And you put C12, it doesn't do anything but give you disaster pants. Uh, and then studies came out of UC San Diego saying, oh, look, four times more ketones from C8 versus C10 versus uh, C12. Mm -hmm. So each of those things, I'm like, all right, you can feel it. You can sense it if you're trained to do that. Uh, and then you move on from there. But when you put that stuff in a blender, it has very strange behavior around water. We can't even tell you if it makes an exclusion zone because it's the only, really, it's the only fat that's soluble in water to the extent that it is. So getting it to hold still so you can look at it under a microscope when it's transparent and water's transparent is really difficult. So that represented a challenge in the lab. But, so I couldn't tell you that it does, but it probably makes one. But even if it doesn't, when you blend it, you can blend it with anything. And this is a crazy thing, but... Everyone who's a wine connoisseur knows if you want to aerate your wine, you can blend it for a second with a little whippy thing and then your wine's aerated. I think Tim Ferriss first did a video on that that just went crazy. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, he's like blending his wine. What's he doing? He's like, it making it taste better. Well, I had leftover wine after dinner and I threw some brain octane in the wine because one thing that C8 does, it protects the liver from LPS-induced toxins, mm -hmm. it's lipopolysaccharides. Uh, which is a primary reason that bad bacteria in your gut cause inflammation. So I found a study that said it does that, and alcohol increases damage from LPS. Okay, we we'll cancel one out with the other. Uh, and so I threw some ice in there. And yeah, as a, if you're a wine snob, like, that's disgusting and horrible. I'm like, guys, it was waste wine. It was an experiment. And I blended it for a while. I figured maybe there's some cool stuff going on. And I will tell you, everyone who tried that was going, what the heck? Like, this is fantastically good because your body will sense when you're drinking something that has extra energy in it, and it's not a flavor, it's a feeling. And when food is cooked properly, like, oh, I want that. And that's one of the reasons we like fatty foods, and especially good fatty foods. Something made with proper grass-fed butter tastes better than something made with margarine. And it's hard to say, well, they taste almost the same. It's, it's the feeling your body gets from it. So that was another experiment where what's going on at this really atomic level at <laughs> the molecular level with what we're eating and drinking. Uh, and I think there's something, but actually there's a lot more to be done there, even with respect to fasting. Hmm. So maybe it's not the calories you get, how distributed are they throughout a liquid <laughs> and which yeah. liquid and with what components along with it is coffee or tea better coffee. But you know, yeah. all, all of those are open questions for proving. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And yeah, the, quality is also like huge, especially when it comes to fats and uh, yeah, the, the protein source in general. One of the things uh, we were going to talk about, Superhuman, my anti-aging book yeah. that came out a few months ago, was on the New York Times list for a couple of weeks. I, I like to go really deep. One of the reasons for writing, and I, when I read your books, I get the same sense from you. It's, like, it's an excuse to go deep on the research and then pull it together in a framework for understanding so then you can understand it better and that also allows you to be able to write a book that's worth reading. Um, so I went down that path and I found some, a study and I'm not remembering the date from it right now but it's cited in the book around when you eat fat, where does it go in the body? And 
like I've, I've known for a very long time, the whole anti-aging world has known for 25 years that you can measure in the blood the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fats. And normally you have like a, a four to one ratio there for six to three, and that's considered a, a healthy anti-aging ratio. Over the course of manipulating my lipid membranes, I've gotten myself down to about 1.28 to one, which means very low omega-6. Uh, newsflash, omega-6s are essential fatty acids. <laughs> that probably yeah. wasn't healthy. The only guy I know who's been lower than that was uh, Larry Smarr from UC San Diego, one of the professors there who uh, took huge amounts of data and then 3D printed a picture of his own colon. Uh, and one of the, the early speakers at a quantified self-conference, he, he was mm. slightly lower, like 1.08 if I remember right. I'm like, okay, we're going to race to the bottom of disrupting our cell membranes with <laughs> not enough omega-6. Yeah. So one answer to that would be, hey, let's just drink some corn oil. No problems, except <laughs> those are all damaged omega-6s, and that's going to do much worse, uh, much more of a problem versus you know, eating some walnuts that are kept in the fridge, which are going to be not oxidized, or having some olive oil. Frankly, eating some beef that ate grass, there's omega-6 in there. So I would imagine I have higher levels now, haven't tested in a while. But in superhuman... Oh, and by the way, you know this, this is just for listeners, the average Western diet eater has a ratio of 40 to one instead of four to one. So there's 10 times more omega-6 and most of it is the deep fried, crappy, yeah. you didn't want to do this, soybean, canola, corn, uh, I don't know what other crappy oils people eat, but all the, all the bad ones. Yeah. Um, but what this new study that, I, uh, that I, I wrote about covered was, okay, if you eat a fat, where is it going to go in the body? And it's not at all evenly distributed. I was sort of blown away. The brain will peg itself at 45% saturated fat, and it'll do that until the end of time. It, it's actually way more important than the omega-3 or omega-6 ratio, which swings all over the place in the brain. So your adipose tissue, uh, the, the stuff under your skin, you just the, the white fat, that stuff is also highly variable. So it'll store the most inflammatory fats very, very quickly. So if you're carrying extra weight there, if you eat that, that you know, bottle of corn oil, <laughs> it's going to go into your white fat and generate free radicals like crazy. Yeah. Uh, but it'll also go into your muscles or into your blood cells in different ratios. And I record the different ratios. But if you lose a ton of weight through fasting, through, I'm going to say clean ketosis or clean cyclical ketosis with grass-fed stuff, that would be bulletproof. Uh, but I believe cycling is very necessary for it, even more so now than I did 10 years ago. But however you do it, you, you lose a ton of weight. But then if you say, all right, I'm going to have a cheat meal. <laughs> and your cheat meal is, I'm going to go eat you know, French fries and <laughs> crappy oils. You're, you're going to build your cells out of those oils, and it's not yeah. going to end well. You're going you're gonna to wreck it. So at least mm. when you go off a of fast, eat the best fats that aren't all you know, cooked at high temperatures and fried and grilled and all that because you're replacing stuff and you want to be built out of pristine materials, not built out of crap materials. And this goes beyond ketosis. It goes beyond fasting. It's just one of those, okay, if you put it in your mouth, it's either fuel or a building block or a toxin. And we eat way too many toxins and don't know it. We take damaged building blocks and fuel is not really an issue for most of us in the West because there's enough calories. It's not been a calorie issue. <laughs> it's yeah. like what was writing along with the calories. And, and that's also been a message in biohacking that is very hard for people to accept. You know, the, the food safety thing, the toxins from Mother Nature, in the Bulletproof Diet before Superhuman, I said, all right, guys, here's the toxins that are messing with you. There's lectins, there's oxalates, and uh, let's see, there's mycotoxins, and there's biogenic amines, mostly like histamine. Right? And if you account for those four, you're getting it from most of the, the things that will get you. Some, for some people, it's solanine, and there's other little compounds they're sensitive to. But you take out those four things, you might be fine on some, but not others. And that's also outside of ketosis. And it's funny. I went on the Joe Rogan show a while ago. Uh, it's got to be like five, six, seven years, whatever. And I was on, and he started drinking Bulletproof coffee. He was like, this is the best thing ever. You know, changed his whole brain and all this. And then his buddy decided to knock off the brand, like try to steal the brand. Uh, and then it was like, Dave's a bad man. And the last <laughs> time I was on there, I was like, I wanted, before it, it got weird, for financial reasons, I was like, I want to do something for Joe and his followers. He has them all drinking kale smoothies. And so I sat down and said, Joe, I put together a blog post because uh, I know that you guys have been doing kale smoothies. I'm going to tell you how to do kale safely. 
because this happened. I was a raw vegan. And when you eat lots of raw food or lots of kale in general, uh, you get a buildup of this toxin in the body and it's not a good thing. And it causes kidney stones. It causes tartar on the back of your teeth. It causes vulvodynia in women, which is basically pain in the perineum around the vulva. Uh, and it's even tied to autism and joint pain and gout and all sorts of bad stuff. So guys, cook your kale, drain the water. When you're cooking it, have some calcium carbonate or even baking soda, anything to precipitate out the oxalic acid. So that instead of precipitating in your blood with calcium and then making tiny crystals throughout the body, maybe you could do that in the pan <laughs> and then you, you drink it. Uh, sorry, then you dump the water and then you eat the food and you put, put it in your smoothie. You can make you know, blocks of frozen kale or you could just say kale's disgusting you could use it as a little decoration on the side of your plate like it was meant for and then you could eat some other vegetables but whatever and so be like ah such bullshit such bullshit and then just last week joe goes on there and he's like well guys i had to lay off the kale smoothies because of the oxalates and i'm like <laughs> yeah. i told you six years ago buddy six years <laughs> and all these are in the realm of biohacking but it's a framework okay now I've got my fasting down. I've turned on autophagy. Um, I fixed my metabolism. What am I going to put in there that's not going to gum it up? And I found those are the big categories. Um, last night, for instance, um, I live on a small farm. And it's awesome because, I mean, I grow most of the food, especially during a pandemic. Uh, it's in you the know, middle of summer and there's a vibrant garden. And we have a dozen pigs, a dozen sheep. So lots and lots of fat here, and I know what they ate. In fact, my pigs eat the bulletproof diet. They do intermittent fasting. <laughs> they get brain octane oil. They get activated charcoal, and they get all the vegetables. Like these are it's the best pork of my life. Right. Well, we cooked a, a roast yesterday for lunch, and we didn't put it in the fridge. Just waited till dinner. Pork and fish are the two types of food that form histamine most quickly during a bacterial breakdown. But normally you'd think it was a roast. It should be able to sit out for five hours. And if it was beef, it would have been fine. But because it was pork, by the time dinner rolls around, I ate it. I'm like, you know what? My brain is a little bit off. I can, I can just feel it, right? So I took a few things that counteract histamine. I took black cumin seed oil. Uh, I took a DAO, which is an enzyme that blocks it. Uh, and I felt fine. Oh, and a little bit of dark chocolate seems to work like magic. Who would have thought? Mm. Anyway, I was fine. But my, my wife was like, what? And she actually got hives from it. Oh, wrong. Uh, but at lunch, we ate the same thing with no issues, right? And both of us are relatively histamine sensitive in the overall scheme of things. And other people that would eat that and say, I have nothing. And the same thing. You can give two people uh, kale and one of them's like, man, the next day I had to pick rocks off the back of my lower teeth. I'm like, yeah, you're, you already have problems with your kidneys or something going on, but there's little ducks in the back of the mouth. All of these are part of biohacking. All of these are understanding what came along with the fat and protein <laughs> because those yeah. categories don't even mean anything. And by the way, if I deep fried that pork, it would have been something different than if we slow roasted it. Uh, so you, you can just keep looking at these different layers going, what matters? And the answer is, how do you feel? <laughs> and if you're not sensitive to histamine, you can have you know, kale pork roll-ups, but I'll tell you, everyone is sensitive to oxidized fats over time. Whether you feel it in your brain, you feel it in the, how your skin looks the next week, I don't know, but it will kill you. And so in Superhuman, I'm doing my best to stack rank this and say, all right, guys, there's four things that are going to kill you. So if you want to live to 180, which is what the book is about, you might as well not die of these four things. And then there's seven things that are causing aging that we didn't know about before. And if you say, oh, I'm just going to fix three of those things, you're probably still going to age. You'll age better. But if you fix all seven of those, or at least slow them down to allow technology that's coming online very quickly to help you, you have a really good chance of living well beyond 100, under your own power, independent, but full of wisdom now, because you learn a few things being alive, even for 70 years. Yeah. You know, it's another 30 years on top of that, and you can still walk around and do what you want. You're kind of masters of the universe. You're like, oh yeah, I saw that in 1920, I saw it again in 1962, and I saw it again in 1983, pretty sure it's happening again. Right? I can't say that. I wasn't around then. And when I talk to people who are 90, and I've had a couple of Nobel Prize winners on Bulletproof Radio in their 90s, oh my God, they're so smart. Mm. Right? And, and their brains are still working. And I want to be like that when I'm 94. And I want to be like that when I'm 124 and say, yeah. you young kids over there, you don't know what it was like when I was old. <laughs> Except I'll probably be on whatever the Insta snap that they're doing at that time in virtual reality goggles. I'm going to be right there with them because I have the energy to do it and my brain still works.
yeah 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 that's yeah that's really good and you know there's there's a difference between like aging this dysfunctionality where you are like you know just deteriorating slowly but and there's also this aging more gracefully or aging in a functional way where you are you're like yeah highly creative and productive even in the like last years of our life and uh, most people yeah. just most people associate living longer with the deterioration so that if you tell them that would you like to live until 100 then they think that they're going to be in a wheelchair or in a like a coma or something <laughs> but that doesn't have to be like that if you take care of yourself yeah. and, uh, you know yeah the, there's a difference between the perception of uh, what we think aging means in our society I, I was really surprised. I was having this conversation with uh, Maria Shriver, um, who is, uh, you know, uh, she was married to Arnold Schwarzenegger and, you know, very well-known uh, person, a uh, uh, member of the Kennedy family. And I've done a lot of work to support her women's Alzheimer's movement um, uh, charity project because women get Alzheimer's more than men. And that's one of the big four killers that's in superhuman. So I, we're having a conversation. I think it was on her show. And I, I said something about that, and she kind of recoiled and said, "God, no! I wouldn't want to live that long." <laughs> I'm like, "But you know, you're, you're in such a great position." But it was because the first thing that came to her mind was what you just described: wheelchairs and you know, diapers and tubes, and not knowing your own name and all that. And it's kind of horrifying. And so, part of my mission here, and I'm intentionally including anti-aging as part of biohacking. Look, if you want to have control of your own biology, that's all biohacking is: not getting old is a big part of it, or better yet, not feeling old and not looking old and not having old cells. So I'd like to get very old, but I'd like to do it undetectably. <laughs> yeah. And when you replace the picture you just described and the one that Maria had with a picture that's a little bit more realistic, which is that, you know what? When I'm 70, I will be walking around under my own power, feeling good, doing whatever I want with my brain fully working. Now do you want to be 70? Like, heck yeah. And it turns out this vision has already happened. You probably know what one of these things is, but have you seen one of these before? Yeah, grip, grip tester. Dy yeah, grip tester, dynamometer. Now, the most reliable and simplest way of determining whether someone is elderly or not is their grip strength. And you can squeeze it and it measures your grip strength. About 20 years ago, they had a problem, and this problem was quantified in the U.S. and Japan. They, we said, okay, when you're 65, you're elderly, and it was true based on grip strength. But all these 65-year-olds were like, you know what? Screw you. I am not elderly. I don't feel elderly. I don't look elderly. You know, I'm going for hikes. I can work just fine. So that is a lie, and I'm insulted. And uh, what happened there is uh, they said, all right, let's test some grip strength. And they did a wide testing and they found out, uh-oh, it turns out they're right. So they moved the age for elderly from 65 to 75. Hmm. So we already gained 10 years of, of youth, but it didn't make the news. <laughs> but that's what the scientists did. So we're already on this path of extending the time that we have before we officially are elderly. Me, I do grip strength stuff. I'm, you know, uh, mid to late 40s. It thinks I'm 18. My pulse wave analysis thinks I'm 27. My brain response time, which uh, you can measure called P300, it says I'm 20, right? So I have a 20 year old response time in my brain. And I think it's because for 10 plus, actually more like 15 now years, I have been feeding myself undamaged fats. I've rebuilt my cell membranes. The half-life of fat in the body is, this is in the Bulletproof Diet. And it's somewhere, it's, it's right about two years. It's like 700 and something days. It, it's a yeah. little bit less than that. <laughs> um, so it's going to take you really at least two years. If you go on a diet, let's see, we're half saturated fat. So, so in the recommendations that came out from years of manipulating my diet and all in the first book, where half your calories from fat should come from saturated fats because that's what you're built out of. Yeah. yeah. And who would have thought? But you do that and then you replicate the ratios for the others on damage that you want to and you do that over time. And if you eat a lot of fat, you can actually flush out fat from your body, which is important because guess what else is in your fat? Lipophoric toxins. What does lipophoric mean? It's fat loving. So if you imagine you have a, a you know, test tube with water in it and you put in one drop of food coloring, it just sits there and it slowly percolates. And if you wait 24 hours, it'll be spread throughout. Hmm. But it's the same thing. If you eat a toxin that likes to absorb into fat in your body, it'll do that. It'll be in your myelin sheath. 
which is mostly made of fat that's lining your nerves. It'll be in your cell membranes, which are all made out of fat. It'll be in your adipose tissue. It'll be in your brain. Now, if you want to get that out because it's inhibiting oh, electron transport or any of the other things that toxins and fat can do, well, you're going to have to eat a lot of fat. You're going to have to increase bile turnover and you're going to have to do it for a while. And as you do it, you get healthier and healthier because you've now replaced parts of your infrastructure with undamaged parts of your infrastructure and you washed away the stuff. If you take that test tube and you want to just dump it, well, that'd be called dying. Don't do that. But if you start adding a little bit of water at the top, some of it's going to splash out, but it takes a lot more than one test tube's worth of water to replace all of the water that had food coloring in it. The concentrations go down over time. It's a linear algebra equation there. And that's why I'm just a fan of eating a lot of healthy, undamaged, uh, saturated and monounsaturated and small amounts of omega-6 and omega-3s uh, and doing that over time uh, combined with the techniques of autophagy that cause uh, cells to go away that are probably made of fats you didn't want anyway. Yeah. And doing that over time, it seems like it really works. Yeah. In fact, it works very quickly. <laughs> so true that the fats, uh, they stick around for a long time. And yeah, if you eat bad fats and inflammatory fats, then you are, you're, you're going to be made out of those fats. And those same fats are going to cause more inflammation inside your body because they're you know, spreading the inflammation there. And I, I would also yeah. imagine that you know, burning fat or increasing the fat cell turnover with like, you know, being in ketosis and fasting and increasing autophagy and those things, they, they would also speed up some of the process faster because like mo the majority of people, yeah. they aren't burning fat, like they're burning sugar and carbs on a daily basis. And they never, they never actually even uh, increase the turnover of the rate of the fat cells. And so, so therefore they are inflamed for or like literally for decades and uh, aging themselves faster. You're a hundred percent right there. In fact, I wrote this, this blog post uh, it, on the, the DaveAsprey.com page, uh, which is where I'm putting all my, my latest research and all on the Bulletproof page. I've got all the, the stuff that's like, if it's collagen, MCT, or kind of that side of things, it's all on Bulletproof. All the other biohacking stuff is on my page. And this post, is, it's got to be like seven years old now, but it, it's called the rapid fat loss protocol, how to lose weight faster than you're faster than you should. <laughs> and there's a big warning at the top. And it says, look, this is for people who have to fit in their wedding dress. You don't have much time. And there are, are actors who've used it before their shirts off scene. And it works very, very well. And it's basically a combination of fasting and ketosis with clean fats and a whole protocol. But the problem is, and the reason I warn people about it, I'm like, I'm not joking about taking activated charcoal and glutathione when you do this, because if you're going to lose five pounds of fat, right? Five pounds of fat all at the same time, all of the toxins stored in that fat, and by the way, we biopsy the fat, heavy metals, pesticides, I mean, it is full of stuff. You have to process those. And if you don't bind those toxins, um, you are going to experience extreme brain fog. And the number of people who don't heed that <laughs> and say, Dave, I didn't believe you. I just tried doing it. And yeah, I felt like I got brain fog. Mm. Uh, and I, it took me six weeks to feel like myself again. Just I, I couldn't focus. I mean, yeah, that's what happens when you dump all the pesticides and metals from your fat into your circulatory system. You didn't have a way to escort them out, which is what activated charcoal does. Uh, so that's something that I think is under appreciated in the fasting world is that, you know, you might want to take some charcoal when you're fasting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I added charcoal to the world of biohacking. It was one of the first products I did at Bulletproof because it turns out most of the charcoal in the market used a larger particle size than was ideal. So I got the finest particle size charcoal, which uh, was very hard to manufacture because it makes like clouds of fine black dust everywhere. Yeah. But uh, we got it out the door. Yeah, that's a good, that's good advice and uh, helps to kind of eliminate the detox symptoms that happen if you are like burning fat at a really high rate. Uh, yeah. But you mentioned in that in the super, book Superhuman, you talk about the main causes of aging. So uh, can you go through what are the main causes? The main causes of aging, there are, well, okay, let me do the four killers first. Um, those are diabetes, which is a risk factor for the other three. Then it's cancer, cardiovascular disease, uh, and Alzheimer's. Uh, so you've got to fix your metabolism and not get diabetes, which reduces your, your odds of getting any of these other things. The reason for those are really straightforward. First step of living a long time, don't die. So if you play the odds, that's what kills most people. It's one of those things, right? And you might be hit by a truck. That's a different one. That's a, a low iron diet. And then 
in uh, in Superhuman, the other seven pillars were where I spent uh, the the bulk of the book, and I will do these uh, from memory. And uh, one of them is what I call uh, zombie cells, one that you'll appreciate effectively. You know, these are, are senescent cells that are are floating around in the body. They're not dead. Uh, but they're not performing their function. They're making free radicals and they're not contributing. So these are kind of hang, hangers on, for lack of a better word. And you need to kill senescent cells. Um, there's also toxins inside the cells uh, that gum up the works. And you can imagine there's uh, parts of the cell um, that are essentially like a furnace and their job is to you know, burn up proteins inside the cells. And the problem we have there is some things don't burn. So imagine you have your, your garbage incinerator and you're shoveling garbage in there because it's how you get rid of garbage. But then you shovel in a bunch of metal pieces over time and the metal won't burn. And eventually you can't shovel anything else in there because it's full. Oh, at that point, you have a cell that becomes dysfunctional. And oh, okay, so what do you do? You have to either make a new cell or you have to somehow get rid of what's in there. And there's different techniques talking about that in the book. But one of the things you could do is you could eat less of the things that clog up your furnaces. You'll probably live a lot longer if you do that. And, and the structure of the book is that for each of the, these seven things, here's what the crazy anti-aging, the, the most cutting edge, you know, people are flying around the world. I did as much of that as I possibly could. So I'd go there and I'd do the thing and I'd talk about it. And then I'd say, here's the pathways that we know are real because this, this is possible. Here's the you know, $50, use this supplement or do this affordable thing. And then here's the free version of it, right? So the pathway is real. Let's leverage it to whatever extent we, we believe is important for ourselves biologically and whatever is economically and time-wise feasible. You can spend your whole life flying around the world trying to get anti-aging treatments and then die of circadian disruption. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so that's not, that's not the point of the book. Uh, the point there is what's going on with us. There's also toxins outside the cells which are a, a different issue uh, that you want to deal with. There's cellular stiffening. And I believe a lot of cellular stiffening is driven by these eating bad fats, to be perfectly honest. Um, but there's other causes for it. And uh, let's see, uh, there's mitochondrial dysfunction, which my book before Superhuman called Headstrong uh, is a, a, a very heavy work on mitochondria. It's actually very readable, but it's very detailed research thing about uh, mitochondria in the brain specifically, but it turns out 48% of people under age 40 have early onset mitochondrial dysfunction. And just about everyone over age 40 has some degree of it, and it's just called aging. Mm -hmm. But what that means is they're not as good at taking oxygen and food, whether it's fat or carbs, doesn't really matter, maybe amino acids, and turning them into energy. So if you suck at that, what do you do with the energy? Well, you use the energy to heat the water to make exclusion zone water or structured water. Mm -hmm. You also, after you do that, let's see, are you going to fold a protein? Right? Are you going to take a breath? Are you going to remove senescent cells? Are you going to sleep? Anything you're doing requires electricity. And so if you're running on just lower and lower power because you've gotten your mitochondria messed up, well, you got to fix that. What are mitochondrial membranes made out of? The same fats that your cell membranes are made out of. Yeah. You better eat some good fats if you want your mitochondria to work. It's not that hard. And maybe the paths shouldn't be full of toxins that inhibit mitochondrial respiration in dozens of studies. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I talk even in this book about toxic mold. It's one of the most common environmental sources of mitochondrial inhibitors, uh, which is uh, to me kind of hilarious. Uh, you look at very ancient evolutionary biology. Well, we have this story that says we were these cells, by the way, we don't know what kind of cells they were. There's three or four different candidates. They're all like parasites. <laughs> and we we're floating around the ocean. And then we found these great bacteria. And then we harnessed the bacteria that made, they became our power plants. They're the mitochondria, right? And that is what we've all been taught. And that's kind of what we believe. Now, the alternative narrative that I fully believe after all this research is that there was some red bacteria floating around in the ocean and they found these cells and they moved in and said, hey, look, we got mobile Petri dishes. This is awesome. <laughs> and that was where evolution took off. But those little bacteria are in charge. The mitochondria, they don't just make power. They sense the environment and they change the chemistry of your body as well as the electrical environment. They make hormones. They make neurotransmitters. They do all sorts of sneaky stuff in there. 
they're calling the shots, not you. They're the first line environmental sensors way down in a distributed network um, that eventually rolls up into your brain after enormous amounts of data filtering. Hmm. Uh, and I know that <laughs> because that's how we build data centers. <laughs> that was my whole career in Silicon Valley. And the parallels are eerily similar to the way we're building very highly scalable distributed systems on the internet and the way decisions are made subcellularly and between cells and between networks in the body. And as it rolls up and rolls up, you have to shed data. Uh, otherwise, you end up with this weird problem of having a, a full-size map of the world. It's not very useful. <laughs> it's as big as the world. So you have to pull data out that's less relevant. The body does that before we become aware of it. Yeah. Now, in terms of aging, we've got mitochondria inside the cell, outside the cell, cell stiffening, and we've got uh, the first one, senescent cells. Uh, then we've got uh, telomeres is another big thing. And in the book, I talk about telomeres. Um, people are usually familiar with that because it's been around for a while in the, the world of anti-aging, even in the common press. But the idea is it's sort of like a fuse in your cells. And every time the cells divide, it gets a little bit shorter. And when you run out of fuse, your, your cells can't divide anymore, and then bad things happen. So what would you do uh, to fix this problem? Well, you would go for... Um, uh, you, you'd go for a thing that could lengthen it. And it turns out deep sleep can, fasting works pretty well. But there are some supplements that people have talked about forever. Uh, but they're like $2,000 a month for the amounts of these things. And it takes uh, 50 plus pounds of certain herbs to be compressed into a little bottle. You know, they're, they're getting things from astragalus in order to do that. So I took that stuff for several years with no effect. Uh, and that's a bit of a problem uh, because it's quite expensive. And uh, then I said, well, what if I tried this Russian thing? And it turns out some of the best biohackers on earth are Russians. Uh, I, I don't know why, but it turns out rocket scientists and biohacking, like go to Russia. Those guys are awesome. Uh, so the Russian stuff is like 50 bucks. It comes in a vial and it's a, a peptide. And you inject that stuff and it lengthens telomeres pretty darn reliably. Hmm. And well, wait, Okay, so I read about all this in Superhuman saying, okay, here's the, the, the techniques that you can do. Here's why the pathway is real. Here's the techniques you can do uh, that are expensive. And then here's something that's the cheapest I could find to do it. And if you want to go even cheaper, it turns out sleeping and fasting and some cold exposure and the normal things like that have small effects on telomeres. Hmm. And um, that's one of the things, but the flip side is also dangerous. If you do all of the things I'm talking about here that turn on growth like a young body. Well, what also can grow is cancer, right? Yeah. So there's that risk. In my experience, having talked with hundreds of experts on Bulletproof Radio and having been you know, a lecturer on the main stage of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine a few times uh, and just having gone deep with cancer docs, the vast majority of cancers are mitochondrial in origin. A very small percentage of them are genetic, and some of them are actually fungal that are just uh, kind of confused, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Some of the, the sac fungus things look an awful lot like uh, certain forms of, of things that are diagnosed as cancer, and the cells look almost identical under a microscope. So uh, from that perspective, and that's a lot of what I'm saying on that last point comes from Doug Kaufman's work where people are going, Dave, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Okay, fine. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm not here to debate. here to share. You can, you can do the research. But uh, what's very interesting to me is, as you look at all that stuff, if you upregulate that mitochondrial function thing, which is the cause of aging, you reduce your cause of cancer, sorry, your risk of cancer uh, from all causes. So highly functioning mitochondria are going to power the immune system to get over the genetic cancers, but you still might have to do some heavy duty work if you're one of the whatever, three or 5% there. Uh, and you end up playing this balancing game, but do you want short telomeres? No. Do you want really long ones? Yes. Do you want cancer? No. So if these are the pillars of aging, and that's the interesting thing. Imagine a bar stool. Saying, "Well, I want to sit here for a long time." Okay, well, it has seven legs on it. You know, if you cut off one of the legs, make it a little bit shorter. It's going to be wobbly. But if you cut off the wrong two legs, it's going to tip over, right? And so, uh, what we want to do there is make sure that you're providing some support for each of those pillars of aging. And the book there is just full of things. Oh, look! In this study, this caused rats to live ninety percent longer. What you mean? I thought that wasn't supposed to be possible. I, I heard in the news, there's no such thing as anti-aging. Like, well, I don't know. These scientists did it. And here's another guy who replicated that. That's funny. Oh, and this compound, activated charcoal, 
uh, raises, <laughs> uh, let's see, extends lifespan by 15%. I wonder if that's because of what we talked about earlier, where it's binding to fat soluble toxins in the biliary system and bile and causing them to be excreted. Well, of course that's why, or maybe I'm totally wrong and there's some other reason. I don't care, but the numbers are that it does do that and we have a reasonable hypothesis for it. Yeah. And that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so true. Like it's a, it's a, the aging itself is a like you know culmination of many things, and you can't really pinpoint it into one particular thing. You have to kind of approach it from a, you know, holistic perspective and uh, do as much as you can to minimize the collateral damage. Yeah, you really do uh, have to to look at it as a multifactorial problem. And one of the things that that Western medicine has done is broken that, and it's getting fixed now. Uh, so if it's this multifaceted of a system, people love to look at this as uh, I'm going to, to, as a Western doctor, I'm going to focus on kidneys, right? Or I'm going to focus on bones. And it turns out this hormone made by your bones called osteocalcin is really important as an anti-aging hormone. But you're a bone doctor. You're not an anti-aging doctor. You're not going to see that. And so we've probably known about this somewhere or another for a long time. We know about osteocalcin. But studies just came out a couple of weeks ago saying, oh my goodness, it turns out we can probably inject this stuff and reverse a lot of the diseases of aging. Oh, wow, wouldn't that be useful mm -hmm. to know? So bones are hormonal regulators. But if you're not trained to look at the system of the human body, you won't see the hormonal regulation side of bones. You'll see broken bones, you'll see weak bones. And then an epidemiologist will say, oh, or, or data scientist, I see a correlation between weak bones and other diseases of aging but there is no causal factor. And so the people, the systems biologists were coming in now with the power of big data, these amazing systems, they're just shredding years and years of knowledge saying, oh, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. And they're able to do it so quickly because we have this ability to do machine learning and AI. That's one of the reasons I, I think we can actually do better than 50% on top of our current best. We know there's a couple of people who are 120. We can do 120 as a species, it's already proven. I just feel like we can do 50% better over the next 140 something years. Uh, and I'm willing to, to bet my life on it because, you know, if I, what do you have to lose? <laughs> if I lose, I was going to die anyway. If I yeah. win, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And uh, yeah, I totally agree that uh, yeah, we are almost like at a, this sort of a breaking point, I think, uh, towards the, like the next sort of a next level or a next leap in, in the average yeah. lifespan in humans as well as overall uh, like functionality and uh, health span. And the book and your book also uh, that gives a lot of uh, great details into all these topics that we talk about: your ketosis and sleep and peptides and or other other types of uh, useful things for anti-aging. Uh, but what is your next book about? What you're going to write now? I'm working on some more of the the books that include the psychology of all this stuff. Uh, so it's pretty easy to say you should go eat this stuff. It's pretty easy to say you know, go fast for a day or a week or, you know, avoid protein in the, the Bulletproof Diet I, I talked about. It's one of the first books I know of to talk about autophagy. I said, look, just one day a week of protein restriction increases autophagy. You don't even have to fast. Just don't <laughs> eat protein more than 15 grams. And now we know a little bit more about which types of amino acids you shouldn't do and all that. But the number of people who are going to hear this episode and then go eat a donut is shocking. Okay? Why do they do that? And yeah. how can they change that? So I'm including a lot of that stuff in my next book because as a guy who's lost 300 pounds and has picked up the donut more times than I would care to admit, uh, but I don't do that anymore. Uh, what is the transformation that has to happen in your thought process as well as in your biology simultaneously to get the results you want? Hmm. And what I'm looking for is I want more people to do this with less pain because when people get their biology working, a side effect is that they become nicer to each other. <laughs> yeah. Your anxiety levels go down, so you stop acting like a stressed out asshole. That's yeah. just that's how it is. Yeah. So anxiety can come from the story in your head or it can come from what's happening in your cells. And a lot of times when you have cellular stress, you have systemic stress in the body that's based on biology, we just say, well, I feel like anxiety, it must be, and then you point at the nearest person, it's their fault because we're not very good at filtering where that stuff comes from and then you start acting like a jerk. At least this would have been my path. So I, I feel like I'm less of a jerk when I have control of my biology. And I like that. Yeah, like the mindset is huge. And uh, yeah, it's almost like very, very difficult to make some sort of a bodily transformation if your mind doesn't transform in the process. So you can really like self-sabotage yourself uh, or you can just procrastinate on the things that you know you need to do uh, if your mindset isn't on point or if you have like some sort of a, 
uh, I don't know, like a negative connotation about those things and uh, that sort of thing. So my last question is, uh, what's this one piece of advice or habit you wish you adopted sooner? Hmm. So I had a lot going on biologically. You know, you're 300 pounds, you have arthritis when you're 14 uh, and just all sorts of bad stuff. Um, I wish uh, that I had figured out that your emotions are caused by your biology a lot earlier because you spend a lot of time feeling guilty or feeling shame about the fact that you you are going to pick up the donut and that you yell okay. at people and you feel like crap and then you feel like you're lazy when you can't make enough energy. And if someone have just said, Dave, you have a hardware problem, fix that. Instead, I spent a lot of time thinking I had a moral problem. Like it's because I'm not trying hard enough. So mm. the habit that I wish I'd picked up was just going, I feel like crap. It's probably my hardware. <laughs> if I just had that habit, it would have been so much easier to fix it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so true that sometimes we just, um, even, even if we you know, judge ourselves, then it can also come from the lack of awareness or lack of knowledge about like, what's correct. Or, and you, you, you just become yeah. frust frustrated. Like, I've tried everything and it doesn't work. Like, what's wrong? Maybe you just had the wrong information and you took the wrong, wrong advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it's the self-blame part of it that, that's a big issue there. And uh, I mean, it, it's an endemic problem for, for everyone when they're young. And even if you have the best parents and all, it's just in there. But if someone just explained that to me, like sometimes you act like a jerk and it's because of what you put in your mouth six hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't know that. I'm like, I must just be a jerk. And it wasn't true. Yeah. All right, Sam. I got to run and jump on my next call. All right. uh, thank you I'll for having me on your show. And yeah. keep writing good books. Yeah, you too. I'll see you around. All right. See you around. All right, that's it for this episode of the Body, Mind and Power Man podcast. If you want to support us, then I would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review on iTunes and the other social media platforms. You can now order my new book, Metabolic Autophagy, that covers a lot of the same topics that we talked in here. It's a collection of certain lifestyle habits and practices that prioritize longevity as well as performance. To support this podcast, you can also become a Patreon and get exclusive video lectures from my biohacking bootcamp that covers circadian rhythms, intermittent fasting, autophagy, resistance training, biofeedback, and many more. But other than that, my name is Seem. Stay tuned for the next episode. Stay empowered.